I'm now joined in studio by three, uh, two men and one lady, uh, two from Nakara. It looks like we are hosting a show for Nakara this morning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent Moisia, you know him as Chipukizi. He's joining us. He's a director and a board member for Nakada. We have uh, Judy Twala. She is the regulatory service manager for Nakada, right? And uh, Steve Ogutu, he is a governance and youth expert and commentator so they're here to talk to us about some of the things that are going on especially that documentary on bbc just the other day but before we go to that documentary let's talk about migori rongo university I'll, I'll begin with you in your rounds i know you've only been there for a few months and yes. you've gone to several places what concerns you most about that area especially the county of migori it's the 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 the, the, the amount of wheat that they're consuming uh, okay. around those area it's um it's, it's very worrying. And the thing is that most of these people that take, take those drugs, for them it's very cultural. Because, uh, you know, most of the people around that area, that region, they actually even grow it. So even when you try and, you know, you talk to them and tell them that this drug that you're taking, it's dangerous for you, it'll kill you, it'll kill you, they're like, ah. They used to it. In Marashiet, wewe ongelea pombe, lakini, this one, no. So the... The, actually, the, 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 I saw you trying to, to struggle with the... With John Badad. Yeah, but tell us what... Yeah, kikwambia changa and all that, but <laughs> trust me, uh -huh. it's... Uh, weed it's, is bad. Weed is bad. Ini bangi wapi, niya ile ya Tanzania, it's grown in Migori. Well, some it's grown in Migori, yes. na kuna pia ya vihiga. Coming, making its way to yes. Migori County. Yes, yes, okay. yes, okay. yes, okay. yes, yes. And, you know, and you, you see most of these people, when... Um, when, 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 when they are taking these things, they don't know, you know. It, I, I was there, Juzi, uh, like two weeks ago, and uh, I was having a conversation with the guy. He was high. He was telling me... High on what? He was high on weed. Okay. So I was trying to tell him that, bro, do you know that uh, weed is a kufanya ukwe munda wa zima? And I was like, no, 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 no. Hii ni marashi. You know? <laughs> what do they mean it's marashi? It's mar I don't know. It's, that's how they call it. Yeah. Yeah, they call marashi. it marashi. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, it so like, it's, it's, it's bad in the county of Nigori. You cannot walk uh, for like three or five minutes mm. without seeing a madman. Okay. Do, do you know in Migori, because I come from the county of Migori, one, we grow a lot of tobacco, although it's changing Alliance 1 and mm -hmm. BAT, they've really cut down the amount of tobacco they grow in that area. And then secondly, there's a lot of bang that comes out of uh, Tanzania because we are at the border is Banya, Ta mm -hmm. Taranganya coming into the county of Migori and of course Kuria land. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of also and all this weed that is usually netted along the way. Most of it, if it's reported, they say it comes from uh, Southern Nyanza, you know, so it's across the border. Judy, uh, you've been there um, uh, longer than Chipukizi. Perhaps what's the concern with what's happening in the county of Migori? Um, uh, thank you, Ken. I will focus on maybe the region, okay. uh, Nyanza and the Western, of, okay. yes, okay. other than just picking Migori County. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, um, the rate at which our youth are engaging with drugs is worrying. And uh, as much as we're thinking about weed, uh, uh, my director has just spoken about cannabis, use abuse of cannabis in Migori, Vihiga and, and that region, we should also start getting worried about the prescription drugs which have been abused at the same rate. Okay. Yes. It's sold across the counter. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, your mandate, mandate for Nakada also boils over to the prescription drugs? No, no, no. That, okay. that remains with the pharmacy and poisons board. All right. Yes. But it concerns you because it sort of adds to what they're already consuming. Yes, because mm. Nakada has a mandate of uh, doing research on the emerging drugs. Okay. So the prescription drugs are a concern to Nakada. What are the hard ones? especially for that region, uh, have they infiltrated that region? Not really, but mm. I am sure if uh, we do baseline surveys, okay. they will advise us. All right. Yes. M Mark, uh, I mean, <laughs> I can call you Mark Good Steve. Yeah. Yes. Uh, tell us, um, probably, because I wanted to ask about your experiences. Like you told us that uh, you <coughs> met a young person who was high on uh, cannabis. But tell us about the prevalence of drugs, because you work with the youth, you That's work fine. with the communities, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm telling you, um, this is not just a Amigori issue, it's, it's a national issue. Yes. And we have a lot of young people who are suffering because of this, you know, addiction and all that. And it not only affects their health, but in areas, I'm sure Nakada knows this, in areas where we have high prevalence of um, drug addiction like bang and alcohol, mm -hmm. um, you realize that in such areas, 
uh, education is also affected. Majority of young people don't go, don't go to school, you know. Okay. Uh, they start uh, losing focus at a very tender age. And I'm thinking that uh, I think there's need to have a more um, maybe renewed strategy, renewed strength to, f to address this menace and try to collaborate with other stakeholders in this, in this space so we can have an amicable solution to this. Okay, yeah. so it's cut across. All right, to begin this discussion, um, perhaps uh, I'd like you have been there a few months, I'd like the most remarkable story you've heard about uh, a drug consumption to a person or to a community or to a group that completely wiped it off. For example, in uh, central Kenya, we have uh, stories of a whole community, a whole generation wiped out because of uh, alcohol. So there's a gap between age groups. There is the, our <coughs> parents, uh, 60, 55, 60 and above. Then there's this, our age mates. And then there is a place that it disappeared. I did a story in central Kenya some time ago. I went to schools where you could get just a small class of about five, seven students because they are no children mm -hmm. and it was blamed on alcohol. So uh, perhaps let's start there. If you have had a remarkable story about drug abuse and from where? The, 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 from Nairobi. The, okay. I've, I've, I've found um, actually something that I'm following up. There's a young girl. She's, uh, she just turned uh, 17. Mm -hmm. So the, the dad and the mom, they, they, were, they, they were young parents. And you know they they were they were consuming hard drugs, and you know uh, they were unable to take care of the girl, and you know the girl had to to seek you know she had to seek um, help from other people, and yet these parents are still alive. You okay. know they are high on on you know they are addicted to very hard drugs. Okay. But then again they can't afford to go to a rehab, and then again yet they have a young girl here who wants to study and pursue her dreams. But then again, you know it's like she's an orphan. Okay. But still, she still have the parents. The parents, yes. The parents are very helpless, mm -hmm. you know, because, and even when you ask them, because, you know, I had a conversation with them, they, they tell you that that's the only thing that keeps them going. And, and the worst part is, and this is what I'm, I've learned, is that when, when, when most of these people, they can't afford these drugs, then they're used by the, the you know, the, the ones who pay all the drugs and all that. You're given them to, to take them so that you can sell. Okay. And then okay. now you forget your responsibility as a parent, as a mm -hmm. father. Mm -hmm. And now you leave your child. You know, she, if if it were not for 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 good Samaritans, that who she would ange kuwa atamal, ange wenda atashule. She, but she's not involved in drugs. She is involved in drugs. She's involved. You know, and she's only seventeen. And okay. She's cool, and you know, she, you know that's her whole. Does she have other siblings? No, she's the only daughter. She's the only daughter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Judy. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps um, the story in your work that you've had uh, that is remarkable um, with hmm. a positive transformation or negative? Um, maybe I've been in Akada for almost three years right now okay. and I can give um, a lot of my ex personal experiences with uh, families which, who are affected by drug addiction. Um, I don't want to to pick out on one, I'll just pick generally. Okay. Uh, this menace of drug abuse is a serious um, challenge to our economy, to our security. And um, maybe if I picked like coast region where we have drug dens, and uh, looking at the young people, you know, young between 17 and 35, these are the people who are supposed to be productive in our country, and they're the people who are, who are in the drug dens, very helpless, mm -hmm. in need of um, maybe rehabilitation or even employment uh, uh, opportunities. I'll just generalize and say that uh, we all, all sectors need to put their minds together and see how we can approach this issue. Okay. Otherwise, the, the problem is becoming serious every day. Okay. Yes. Okay. M before I go to Steve, mm -hmm. uh, my remarkable story is there are a lot of people we went to school with, mm -hmm. and sometimes when you go back to the village, you hide away from them mm -hmm. because yes. the lives have either been destroyed by alcohol mm -hmm. or by Hard weed. Drugs, sure. weed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And coming from that area, and most of the people, your classmates, people mm -hmm. you went to school with, mm -hmm. and you see them sometimes even in the where you live, you find them and. Um, even meet with them in town. You meet with them in town and you don't want to face them mm -hmm. because you know what destroyed them. Unfortunately, there's very little help that you could offer to them at that time still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very sad. And uh, I think this, like I said, it's, it's a societal issue. Mm -hmm. And um, it has, there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, things that contribute to, 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 to you know, uh, this uh, drug menace and, and things like that spreading across the country. 
And for me, I think that um, one of these things that I have had to, uh, to, to encounter from an experience with somebody who, was, who, was, who, who is an addict mm -hmm. is actually you, most of these people will tell you that you know, um, most of them don't have role models, people to look up to. Okay. So at the age of, say, five or six, maybe your dad is already smoking or is very alcoholic then you start going, that, going toward that direction. And so, that's why I'm saying that it's this, the fight against drug abuse and alcoholism requires um, a, a multi-sectoral approach, you know? Let parents play their role and the community play their role. You know, let bodies like NACADA play their role and also let the government have, partner with other organization and have initiatives that are very genuine, that are geared toward changing behavior and, and, and attitude. Do you think that's not addiction. happening now? It is happening, but I don't think, um, maybe what they need to do is to change their strategy. You know, have a renewed, a renewed uh, strength and, and strategy toward the fight against, against this menace mm -hmm. going forward. Yeah. Do you think the kind of campaign, for example, the kind of campaign that NACADA has, and we've had even a former NACADA boss coming up with laws, you know, um, you, you think there's need for shift in how they approach fighting uh, drug abuse in the country? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we have very good campaigns going on, but then we are not addressing, you know, like um, dealing with the people who are peddling these drugs. Okay. So I think even if we can do so many campaigns, but if you're not addressing, dealing with these drug loads, then we are doing zero work. Do you remember what President Uhuru Kenyatta said a while ago? Anyone who is selling drugs to our children, you know, it was a very stern kind of a warning to them. Yeah. But it still happens, especially in Mombasa. And he's a, a regular visitor of Mombasa, so perhaps first time, because you fly right from the airport, it's been cleaned up, but you can see all that. So perhaps that's the kind of approach. That's I don't right. know, what's the new strategy, your mindset when you join NACADA? Uh, you're a young person, right? And you've seen it, you deal with them every single day. You do a lot of community outreach, you know. Apart from just being a director of NACADA, you're an influence to the youth, right? So your mindset when you join NACADA? Well, one, I think I'll borrow what he said. Yes. It's uh, the, the fight against drug abuse. It's not an NACADA fight or the government fight or... Uh, uh, or, or media fight. Okay. It's our fight. It's our problem as a society. So we need to come together, like you said, as parents, as teachers, as everybody, mm -hmm. and, and address it. You know, uh, It's how you parent your child. It's when you take your child to a school where there is a teacher who is smoking. You know, you can't be smoking and come into class to tell me that uh, cigarette kills. I'm still... I'm, I'm you can't be storing alcohol in the house and tell your child... Yes, yeah, you can't be coming bad. home drunk yeah, and you're yeah. telling me that not to drink. You can't mm. be taking me to a bar mm. to have fun yes. and then at the end of the day... You, you drink me. soda, I drink alcohol you by guess, the side, it doesn't yes. Make sense. So it's, it's our problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to start having conversation, even as young people. Mm. You know, we need to warn it and say, it's ours and how do we help each other? One, let's talk to each other. Let's okay. listen to each other. Like you've said... When I meet with a friend of mine who he was good, he was a good guy, and then he got into drugs and he's addicted, let me listen to him. Maybe he just wants somebody to listen to them so that he can come out of that problem. Yeah. But also, when it comes now to creating awareness and you know even rehabilitating these people and trying to change them, my mindset is of I don't want to create an awareness and then I don't want to come and tell you that stop taking these drugs and just just leave you. I'm into the idea that when when and you know this it needs a lot of work. When, when we come, let's say we go to Mukuru, for example, we tell guys, you know, guys, uh, alcohol is bad, weed is bad, blah, blah, blah. But then again, let's, because all they'll tell you is that the reason why it's because you went to drugs is because we are jobless. Mm. You know, it's an excuse, yes, but it's valid. We, we don't have anything else to do. We are idle. This is the only thing that keeps us going. But then again, when you tell them that this thing will kill you, leave them with something. Say a project, mm. give them a business, take them to an institution where they can be given... Um, you know, uh, some some accreditation, you know, a certificate that they can do something. Keep them busy. Okay. Yeah. Keep them busy. Um, when you walk out of Nation Center right after this interview, for example, and go through the back entrance of Nation, you're likely to meet a lot of um, street children, you know, with uh, glues stuck on their lips and uh, sniffing. In the evening, when you leave for home, you'll find them sleeping all over the pavement. And one of the things they tell you about um, why they're addicted to the glue, for example, is because it makes them forget. You know, um, probably the youth in the informal settlement say it's because we don't have any other option, right? And um, 
it's always this because of this because of this because of this i'm wondering because you've just mentioned it's not an excuse um it's, it's something that can be done but i'm just wondering what options uh, steve do we offer them what options do we give them oh i think uh just borrowing from what he said um there is need to have uh, and maybe i need to say this again most of the projects we have initiatives that we have we have a lot of them funded by NGOs and things like that mm -hmm. to support them get out of this um, drug addiction. But then most of them are just like white elephants. These projects are designed and then uh, money is brought, but then money is not used, is not used for the intended pur purpose. Mm -hmm. So again, I think the government need to start cracking the whip and okay. just making certain that um, these projects are well implemented and um, the desired outcome uh, I realized, you know. So the goals are set right from the beginning. That's let, right. let, let, let me go to now the substance of our dis discussion, right? You get these people off the streets, right? Uh -huh. uh, we have had the problem. It exists. Then now they're supposed to be rehabilitated. And you take them to halfway houses. You take them to rehabilitation centers. And now BBC had this exposure on what's happening in one or two or three of the rehabs in Isile. As a director of regulations, right, um, let, let me begin with you. How do you license? Do you inspect? Do you uh, do a random check on these institutions? Uh, thank you, Ken, for that question. Uh, NACA NACADA is mandated to inspect to, to ensure compliance of national standards for treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, in this regards, therefore, every year we inspect randomly okay. all rehabilitation centers uh, located all over the country. And um, it was very unfortunate. Uh, you watched it already? Yes, okay. it was very unfortunate. I think begin by telling us if those are licensed rehabilitation centers. No. They are not licensed. No, so okay. they were operating illegally. Have you shut them down? Yes. Okay, they shut down as yes. of today. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I would want to say that uh, we have national standards which, we, which are aligned to the international standards of treatment and rehabilitation. And during our inspections, which is a um, multisectoral approach, we have the Ministry of Health incorporated in the inspection committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, I'm assuming interior because of the police? Yes. Okay. We, we have NACADA ourselves yes. and we have the... Um, the county government, represented okay. by the county department of health, okay. uh, we go to facilities to to check on um, how how do they engage the professionals that work in those facilities, and we have our our minimum requirements. For example, for you to work in a rehabilitation, you have to be certified by NACADA as an addiction professional. We also expect those facilities to have psychiatrists. If they don't have in-house psychiatrists, they should show us mm -hmm. a contract uh, <coughs> where they have engaged a psychiatrist who comes to check on the patients regularly. Okay. You have to have a social worker. Social workers will help you with the community outreaches. You know, we want to destigmatize addiction because as we all might be aware, um, the World Health Organization has categorized addiction as a disease. Uh, so NACADA's role um, mainly is to check on compliance to those standards. Sanitation. How clean is your, is your facility? How well ventilated is it? How is the spacing of bed, beds? Okay. Yeah, where are the toilets placed? Do we have emergency doors? Do we have fire extinguishers in case there is a, uh, a fire breakout? So we look into all those issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you watch the documentary. It's very disturbing to say the least. One, how inhumane those people are treated. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it also brings to question what she has answered. Mm -hmm. How these satellite rehabilitation centers come up? Are they even licensed? I think she's answered that adequately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and perhaps before he answers, how comes this has been operating without your knowledge? Um, it is very unfortunate uh, mm. because uh, I think most people have, are taking rehabilitation and uh, treatment as a um, commercial business, which is very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And I would advise Kenyans who would want to start rehabilitation facilities, kindly get authorization from NACADA okay. so that we can give you the standards you, that you need to comply to. Okay. Otherwise, you start a rehabilitation center without the authorization of NACADA, mm. you, are, you, are, you are operating illegally. Uh, in fact, probably you also need to do what the pharmacy and the poisons board nowadays do. Mm -hmm. Right at the entrance, when you walk in, it's something very visible. 
that shows you that they are accredited. They even put the number there mm -hmm. that you can just check randomly. Are they accredited to sell drugs? So you watched the documentary. Your initial yeah. comments about what you watched. Wow, it was it was very disheartening and very upset. You know, I watched it and, um, you know, I think I think um, I want to condemn it with the strongest stand possible. And actually, I want to go back to 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 you to, to, to Nakara guys. You know, when I watched that bit, there's a place where that guy called Ben was saying that he reported to you guys about this thing that was going on. It's the worker. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm. The, what was going on at the at the rehab, the so-called rehab. And then I think you took so long to respond. You're responding after an expose by, by, by BBC. So I think you also need to up your sock and be more proactive. Um, maybe, maybe you may say you don't have enough staff and things like that, but just try and see how best you can have your tentacles but All perhaps the so first question is, was it really reported before you go to Chipukis? Did, did Nakara get that report? Uh, sure. We, we oh, got, you got the report? We got that report. Okay. And okay. Uh, like if you watch the documentary to the end, I was interviewed. And I said that uh, when we received those uh, information, because we got information about so many rehabilitation uh, centers in the country, and um, we have to be very wise so that we don't just act from malicious, uh, uh, malicious perspectives. We want okay. to investigate and be sure mm -hmm. that the, the allegations are true. Okay. Yes. Okay. But, but here is what I want to say, maybe going back to your question. I think that now um, what we need to see is actually um, clear investigation by the, by, the, by the DPP or the DCI office. Let there be a clear investigation. These people belong to, to the jail. I mean, um, the kind of physical torture and mm -hmm. physical abuse we saw, I mean, that cannot be accepted okay. even if um you know human rights must be respected sure. you know and uh, you cannot undermine human rights because of religion or okay. things like that like what you were seeing in that i'd case. like to talk about the details of what we watch probably in a minute because we have to take a break uh, your initial comments because we'll come to the substance of that i think she as uh, she's answered what i wanted to say okay but, uh, you know even when such reports are received it mm -hmm. uh, normally you can't just run there you know mm -hmm. to start shutting down and yes, you have, you to, have do. to do your own investigations but, but, but Honestly, one, you have determined these people are not even in your books. What are you waiting for? But then again, you see, uh, again, going back to what you were saying, our mandate always Nakada, it's, it's, it's not to even go and shut them down. You know, when you realize that this place is operating illegally, you have to refer them to, you know, to another agency that, okay. that deals okay. with... You don't shut them yourself as yeah, Nakada? No, okay. no. Okay. Maybe I can add to what you are saying. Yes. We are in the process of gazetting the licensing regulations, which will give us the, the, the entire mandate now okay. to shut. To down. shut, now yes. you, you can. Okay. And welcome back to NTV Today. Ken Mijungu is my name. With me in studio is Steve Ogutu. He's a governance and youth commentator. We have Judy Twala, who is regulatory and service manager. And we have Vincent Mwasia. You know him as Shibukizi, a director and a board member of Nakada. Is it a director or a board member of Nakada? Stop confusing us. Can you it's declare decided. one? Or can President Uhuru Kenyatta declare one? You make a decision. And <laughs> you tell us. Is it director <laughs> or it's board Either. member? Either. Either. Yeah. Board member, director. Yeah. All right, Vincent Mwasia joining me in studio to discuss the BBC documentary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I also want to touch on something at the tail end of this conversation. We yesterday did a story on how Kenyans are mistreated in UAE. Perhaps just as Kenyans, you reflect on that. It doesn't fall on your mandate. Steve is comfortable with that. You might be comfortable, but probably she would not. But we like to reflect. So let's talk about now the inhumane treatment that we witnessed and uh, I know Judy has spoken about people being uh, going for some sort of qualification. So it means Nakada has to accredit you to practice in a rehab. But if you watch the way those people were treating the patients, and first, some were not even patients. Like one gentleman there claimed he was not a patient. Let me begin with you again. What kind of treatment do you prescribe for because i believe being under you you must prescribe the kind of treatment these patients go through uh thank you ken um a rehabilitation center um, before you admit any patient you have to screen and assess if and even do drug testing and uh, so that you can confirm surely this is a person who has substance use disorder okay um it is very unfortunate that uh even mental ill patients were, 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 were admitted in the, at that facility. 
uh, but for we, we encourage rehabilitation centers to purely deal with people who have substance use disorders. But we should also know that substance use disorders may bring mental illness. So in that case, that's where we work with the psychiatrist. Okay. Yes. Uh, and they're allowed to be commercial ventures? Um, the rehab centers, are they allowed to be commercial uh, ventures? Yes, because in the country we only have four public rehabilitation centers. So they're allowed to make money while at it? They, are suppo they can make money okay. as long as they meet our standards okay. and also do no harm to our clients. Uh, and also carry themselves in a very professional way. And it's also good for me to add that we have very good rehabilitation centers in, in the country. And what happened in Darushifa does not uh, represent okay. rehabilitation centers. So we should not just pick one. Perhaps it's only the one that has come to our attention, Chipukizi. Or I mean, Vincent, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I concur with what she's saying, but the, I, I really just want to focus on, you know, what was happening inside there. Yes. And, you know, just being new in all this, it's, uh, you know, when, when you want to help somebody, you cannot help them by hurting them more, you know. And also, it, it goes back also to the, to the families, to the society. When you take somebody to a rehab, you know, don't just take them there and leave them there. You know, do follow-ups, go visit them, ask them, are you okay? People go and dump their families. You know, just because mutu you, amekuamulevi, you leave them there. It's like, it's like you've forgotten them until they come back. So, I mean, that's one thing that I thought, that if these people have been here for a while also, it goes back to what I was telling you, that it's our problem. Because at the end of the day, if they, they go there, they go through what they're going, they will come back and still, you know, continue with continue the problem. Drugs, yes. You know, okay. so um, it was very sad. And... You know, uh, I was, I actually went there yesterday. Okay. Uh, did we need BBC to come and expose? This is, uh, did we need BBC really? No, we didn't. And it was unfortunate. But, you know, sometimes, you know, life leads you where it leads you. Mm. You know, it's, it's a wake-up call also to everyone. This reminds me of a story that um, one of the CNN international correspondents did a while ago. The chains. You remember the chains where children mm. who are yes. born with disability. Mm. That was Mackenzie, I think. Yes, yes it was Mackenzie who yes. did the story. It reminded me of that story. So it calls also uh, to the question uh, as to how Kenyan media houses expose these things. Because those are two major uh, exposures that have been done from outside, the chains and this one. But the reason why I'm bringing that in is because um, what Steve spoke about, uh, reporting and yet no action is being done. So perhaps uh, uh, there's a, a level of compromise that nothing happens. I don't know. You can speak to that now that well, you're a governance expert. <laughs> and actually, that is the first thought that came into my mind, you know, what you've just said. And I think, um, I think what, we, what we need to see is, um, is, is, is a really, you know, uh, serious and committed um, agencies. I'm not saying Nakari is not committed, but like you said, it's a wake-up call. And so you, you do, do, your, do your duty with other um, agencies and make certain that um, your services are well delivered. And again, going back to the issue of, um, you know, we didn't have to wait for BBC actually to come and do this story. You know, um, it shows that it, 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 it puts a very big question mark on even our, our investigative agencies. I mean, we can't have such kind of gross, you know, inhumane treatment in a country, and yet the police are not even aware. And in that clip, actually, actually, the I saw police a cop took dropping, some that's patients, right, yes. dropping some patients there. Mm. And, and it's a very sad effect. I think what we are seeing here is actually, maybe from my understanding, is these, some of these rogue um, <coughs> unregistered rehabs are colluding even with cops, you know? They're given some tip and you're told, please uh, protect us and, and shut up so that you don't expose us or something like that. Mm -hmm. And those are very, um, those are very moral, uh, immoral behavior, you know, and very uh, unprofessional. But and, do, you, and, do you blame them? Because sometimes I think, and you, you might want to add onto this, that even it, it, there's a lot of shortcuts, even in the families that take their patients to the rehab, the shortcuts, you go to the nearest, you don't have to verify, you don't have to verify with NACADA, you don't even know, like you said, they go and dump the patients there. And so it's, is it also a problem of shortcuts because it's just next door, you know? It's a, it's a, it's a problem of mentality. It's, you, have, you have this mentality 
that you have a burden in your house and you just want to let get them rid of go. that burden. You just want them to go. Yes. You know, because again, also, and I'm not saying that it's that's what people should do, but again, also before uh, before they go even there, you know, like I'm thinking if I'm to take my 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 brother, and you know, you, you can also do a background check to where you're taking. You know, you know, make a few phone calls and all that, but you can't blame them. You know, uh, like like you're saying. But again, uh, it, it's, it's something that I'm into it. Also culture. You know, when I went there yesterday, something struck me. When, when you look at that facility, it's Mushta, Mushta Him. Mushta Kim. It's built in between flats. So when you're on fourth floor, you can actually see inside. What's happening. You, c you can directly see what's happening inside. And even outside there, the, the, the people who are outside, they know the existence of that place. And they actually know... But it's well labeled, actually. It was labeled, right? Yeah. But if it's labeled rehab, and you're up there, and you can see these people are being punished inside here, you know. But then, you know, I had a conversation with a few people, and they were telling me, you know, uh, So it's also a, a, a conversation of culture and, you know, the way the community is trying to punish the the wrongdoers like like there's a lady who told me that uh, the one of their their daughters was there and this cause she said that she don't want to get married mm -hmm. and so she was taken to that rehab mm -hmm. as punishment so that's not really a rehab. she's thing. not into drugs mm -hmm. she's not a drug addict mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. and and you know some other guy was telling me that a boy was brought in because he was he was a thief he was chuna 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 so you brought in there for punishment so that tells me that the people outside there knows that there is torture inside there. That people are beaten, people are disciplined, and they've accepted and it. And they have exactly. accepted it. Yes. Because one of the ladies, a Somali lady, told me that uh, the Somali culture don't believe in taking, you know, those people who have psychiatric problem into into Madari. Mm -hmm. They believe in their own religious and. That's you know, why they give that concussion that has a funny yes, name. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay. So, so there are so many dimensions into the into the whole story. So essentially, what we're getting out of this is that's not a strict rehab. Yes. It's sort of a jail. It's actually registered as a as a as an NGO. A CBO. As a CBO. A CBO. Oh, yes. mm. You know. So it's quite unfortunate. I think can maybe I can add something. Uh, you you said that um, uh, when we take our people to rehabilitation centers, some of, some of our parents, our guardians are very very genuine. They want their people to change, but it's very unfortunate that uh, even most Kenyans do not know that substance use disorders is a disease. So we are ashamed. For example, if uh, if uh, director is my brother and he, he has a substance use disorder, I don't want to be seen, you know, I want to hide him. Uh, I visited one of the rehabilitation centers uh, some time ago and uh, I had a conversation with a, an elderly man who told me that his family members were told that he got a job in Saudi Arabia. So as far as the neighbors are concerned, the person is in Saudi Arabia. Yet working. he's committed in a rehabilitation center. Yes. Okay. So the stigma that surrounds substance use disorders, which we really need to break, and even the media houses, please help us. Mm -hmm. We need to break this and say these are patients who need medical attention and not to be punished, not to be hidden. Okay. Yes. And they also need love, just like you and I. Okay. Yes. But, okay, I wanted to ask a question that might look a little insensitive, mm -hmm. but because he brought it up, the fact that um, families look at them as uh, liabilities mm -hmm. and embarrassment, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps adds to this. Yes. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. families do. Mm -hmm. So how do you then come and tell us that they need love, they need understanding, they need all that? You know, because it's families that do this. It's, we'll start the sensitizations from the grassroots. In the schools, in private sector, public sector, through the media like we are doing now. Okay. Sensitize people that these people need help. They need help. They don't need to be uh, confined in prisons. They don't need to be confined in torture chambers like we saw in Darushifa. They need to be taken like normal human beings who need attention. Like if I was sick today, if I had diabetes, God, God forbid, my family would not reject me. No. They will raise mm -hmm. money. They will sell land to take me for to treatment. Help, yes. The same case, substance use disorders. Okay. Yes. Steve. I think I needed to add this, that um, um, religion should not be used to undermine human rights, sure. you know. Mm -hmm. Whether you're mentally ill, mm -hmm. you still have 
you know, basic human rights, mm -hmm. right to life, uh, freedom from torture, and, and things like that. Article 53. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that these people will not just, this investigation, I mean, these guys are not just going to bail them, themselves out because I hope they've been arrested. Sure. I'm hoping there's going to be um, prosecution to the end. And oh, they, they were arrested? The guilty. owners of this establishment were arrested? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if they're found guilty, then they need to go to the jail. And again, I also needed to say this, that I think um, what, you, because what uh, Vincent said, you know, <laughs> that this is more of a cultural issue, mm -hmm. you know? Especially for this particular one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's more and and, and, and um, from what we saw there is like, you know, uh, I, I saw a bit where some women were put in a place mm -hmm. and they were trying to cry. They wanted help to get out of that place. Mm -hmm. But because um, there are certain, their, their religion or culture dictates that um, there's certain hierarchy that must be followed in terms of, um, you know, in terms of how you relate to certain people, you know, sheikhs and people like that. So they didn't really have, you know, help, you know, to, 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 to just get out of this uh, deplorable situation. So I think what we need to see, we need to see Supkem uh, coming out and um, condemning this act as, as an umbrella organization for the Islam people in this religion. Because I believe that Islam is a peaceful religion and it cannot advocate for violation of human rights like what we saw in that, in that, in that clip. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have had even religions that don't believe. Uh, I think I saw a report last week where there was uh, a, quite a number of deaths from a religion that doesn't believe that if people from this who practice this religion or subscribe to our ideology of religion need to be taken to hospital when they're sick. And there was a lot of people who died as a result of that. So perhaps is also an explanation to how Muslims would like to deal with the problem. One of the, one of the community that I, I see in um, this country that really never hides such people is the Asians. You have seen they have uh, children who are born with the disorders or disability. They carry them along. They put them, they're always with them in the business premises. That's so fine. perhaps that's one of the explanations uh, because predominantly even the people who are there were Muslims, right? That's right. They were Muslims, yes. And the ladies, uh, did you speak to the ladies once they were released because they looked as though they had a lot of passion and a lot of bitterness in them? Yes, we mm -hmm. did. and. Um, Actually, none of them had substance use disorders. Okay. How uh, many were they first confined to that small group, it was small space? Around six. Six of them? Yes. Okay. Uh, they were there because maybe, like director was saying, they have refused to get married. Okay. Yes, so mm. they are confined there as a way of punishing them. Um, before I continue, maybe there's something, Steve, that I said uh, in terms of soup came coming up and, and, and condemning. condemning. Yes. And I would also want to say that uh, we don't want to look like we are discriminating against any culture, any religion. We respect all cultures, all races, and all, all religions. And Nakada is open to all. If you want to be capacity built to have a better, uh, a, you know, a good rehabilitation center or even to have uh, ambassadors of alcohol and drug abuse among in your religion, in your culture, we can do that. So we are open and we want to work with everybody. Okay, and I think maybe now what you need to do, uh, maybe you're doing it and maybe at, a, at, a not, at, not, at um, some a small level, mm -hmm. is also to start getting into these um, churches and mosques and talking to young people and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we've already started doing that. Sure. Okay. Something we're doing, we're calling it uh, Nakada Machinani, and basically it's Nakada okay. going everywhere. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's why you've seen me, I'm sure Ken, you follow me, you've seen me to Vihiga, mm. we've been to uh, Kisumu, Mombasa, Eldoret. Mm. Yeah, maybe that strategy that you're bringing on board now that you're a new blood into the system is going to, to help address some of these menace. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm, okay. Nakada Mashinani. All right, as we wind up this discussion um, on this particular one especially, I just like to know now the solutions, the solutions we have in regards to one, you say they shouldn't be stigma, stigmatized, you're trying to demystify that. But if someone is watching at home and right by the doorstep, there's a, a drunk uncle or there's um, um, a, a niece or a nephew who smokes bang and probably has distorted uh, the way of thinking and they're not in character. If they're watching, they don't know where to begin because the first thing is where do I begin? Mm. Yes. And re rehabilitation sometimes is also said to be very experienced. 
I've had a, a, a relative who's been taken to, two relatives in fact, who've gone to Asumbi, mm. where there's a rehabilitation center. So it's not cheap. Sure. Treatment yeah. and rehabilitation is not, it's not cheap. Yes. Uh, if you're watching and you don't know what to do, we have a toll-free uh, number, 1192. You can call from anywhere in this country. 24 hours, we are open. Our counselors will guide you. Okay. Um, we, if you want to access rehabilitation centers that are accredited and known by NACADA, kindly check our website. Oh, they're listed on your website? Yes. How many listed. are they in number and uh, what is the spread across the nation? Uh, unfortunately, regions like Northeastern, we do not have any. Okay. Yes. So they have to come all the way to Nairobi? Nairobi. Yes. Okay. Or all the other counties, we have rehabilitation centers. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or all the other 47. So you're talking about one region only without? Yes. Okay. And mm -hmm. maybe to add, we can say that to make treatment and rehabilitation accessible to all Kenyans, NHIF is accredited, has accredited some of the rehabilitation centers. So if you are NHIF accredited, and you need treatment and rehabilitation services, we can guide you through the 1192 number. We will guide you on to which rehabs are accredited by NHIF. That's from the regulatory point of view, yes. from uh, the director. I think for, for me, where, if you're watching and you know you have such a situation, the number one thing that I'll say is, uh, before you even think about rehabilitating, it's let's prevent first mm -hmm. you know we, we let's agree first we have a problem we have people that we need to rehabilitate but also let's have a conversation of preventing mm. so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where we have somebody who has been uh, addicted and we can't take them to hospital so let's have a conversation as people and say that these drugs you know they're dangerous they, they'll addict you they'll kill you and you know if if you have an addict you have somebody who is, who is homesick, you don't know what to do with them. Number one thing, give them love, talk to them. Do not avoid them, you know. Start rehabilitating them by just showing them love mm -hmm. and asking them, you know, how you can help them. And if you surely can't take them to a rehab, then, uh, you know, contact, contact Nakada. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we vet and see that this person really can't be able to, to take care of themselves, I think we have some, some, some measures and policies that we can come in and but my it's let's let's stop drug abuse because mm. it uh, it leads to to situation where you can't handle okay and, and steve yes. working with the youth and the community uh -huh. yes well i think maybe i'll go back to the two points i raised before one is like i said we may have very good campaigns very good campaigns but if these drug dogs are not pursued and arrested and these trade deals um, destroyed, then we will continue having worse situation like what you're experiencing right now. So let the government continue cracking the whip on these um, drug loads. You know, there are very few individuals, but they are causing a whole generation to perish because of drug addiction. And so um, I'm very, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very um, sure that President Kenyatta is going to, to, to work on it and make sure that the future of this, the future of this country as the youth, we are is secured and okay. it's protected from the, the drug laws and people like that. And again, I also need to say that um, this is is, um, is a societal problem, like I said. And so, parents should continue playing their roles. Mm. And when you see somebody in drug, don't just uh, say that oh, that is somebody that is so and so son. So I, it's not my business. I'll step mm. in and see where you can help. Maybe some of these people just need a mentor. You know, they need somebody to talk to them and provide just a little direction, mm -hmm. you know? So it should be a societal problem and therefore requires a societal approach. Uh, yeah, I think that's my take about it. All right, uh, that's well said. Let's just talk in about five minutes. On We ran a story yesterday on the mistreatment of uh, a fellow Kenyans in the Gulf, uh, Middle East, you know, UAE, and all of that. I know there are stories that you've shared across. And uh, the tragedy of this is we continue hearing about this every single day. I don't know if, Judy, you're comfortable with that discussion? Yeah, yeah. You, you're comfortable, all right. So let's begin. You've heard these stories. Perhaps you know someone who has gone through it and come back to the country. And one of the things that comes to my mind is, one, these people need rehabilitation. Even the people who come after undergoing such kind of life in the UAE or whatever it is, right? And it's still happening. Now, my question is, why does this still happen in your mind? 
Why does it stay? Why do we still have an influx of a lot of young people going outside and they get mistreated and we know the stories and others still go the following day? I think it's, it's more, I think it's desperation. Mm -hmm. You know, the urge of wanting to be something and to make something out of yourself. And, you know, you look around maybe and, and th th you can't see something that you can do and then you're told stories. We are all told stories. I remember when I was young, um, I always wanted to go to Spain because my cousins, you know, we had an auntie there and, you know, she would come with sweets and chocolates and she was like the richest person in, in the family. And I've always wanted to go to Spain. Even when I was in high school, I'd tell my, my classmates that after school, my jama me and say I was Spain. Mm -hmm. Because you wanted to go chew. Because I wanted to go uh, sweets and uh, chocolates. I wanted to go and come back with sweets and chocolates. <laughs> and chocolates, yes. You know, just like that. So I think it's it's more like the same situation. Okay. When you're home, you, you're jobless. You you've completed school, and you want to you know to do something to work for yourself or your family. And you're told that the only place that I can get take you to work is it's, it's Dubai. Then why not you go? You'll risk, and then you know you go there and you find it's not what you were told. Okay, and some of those people who leave Kenya, for example, to go to Qatar to work, they refuse to do uh, jobs in the hotels, for example. That's where they end, you know. Mm. Yeah, and also the mentality. I don't know mentality of thinking. Top dollar. Yeah. More money. They pay yeah. more money. Pandandege ni kama utarudi na tau moja ita kuwa double na bill. Judy. Yes, you, you, you view of the problem. The reason why we still have this problem, people go, we have people coming back in caskets, but we still have young people headed there. Mm. Yes. I think uh, maybe even peer pressure. Mm -hmm. Ken went to Saudi Arabia and he's now back driving a nice Mercedes. I also want to go there. Okay. So like the director said, it's desperate. Uh, times calling for desperate solutions okay. but I would want to encourage our Kenyan youth I think we have we have opportunities in our country the government has laid down good structures in support of youth programs the youth fund the um, ways of fund we can take advantage of those and, and grow and develop ourselves locally sure. locally sure. yes mm. yeah. I think this is what I would like to describe as maybe modern slavery you know um, before, people used to be forced to get into slavery. But today, you're lured with, the, you know, you promise a lot of goodies and things like that, and then you go there, you find yourself in a totally different situation. And it's very unfortunate. We've seen people losing their lives and people being physically assaulted, raped. Mm -hmm. It's a very sad affair. And I think that the government now needs to, you know, assert its sovereignty as a country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now, it's, it's a, an in, interstate interstate problem and I know that um, you know we have treaties like the ICCPR that provides for you know freedom from torture freedom from um, uh, freedom from forced labor and things like that and these are universal universal basic human inherent rights that I feel that um, should be invoked and countries that have continued you know um, harassing physically abusing um, non natives um, should should face some consequences you know it's not just about having dialogues and having press conferences and we're still seeing these deaths happening and things like that I mean this should stop and um, another thing that I needed to point out is actually um, we ask ourselves why do we have a lot of Kenyans young women and young men going to, 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 to UAE to seek for employment you know it's simple we have very huge corruption is happening in the country. Look at what happened in the NYS1, NYS2, the Ministry of Health and things like that, you know. This is money that can, could be used, you know, to generate employment opportunities directly or indirectly for these innocent Kenyans who are very hardworking but they don't have an enabling environment to exercise the experience to, 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 to earn a living out of, genuine living out of. So I think and I'm happy actually that the government, the president is cracking a whip again on matters of corruption. Mm -hmm. And I think as a country we need to support him. It's a fight that he cannot win alone. We need to, to join the fight and, and to see how best this can be addressed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have probably short on our time, but as we conclude, um, 
on the kind of measures because again this is something that affects the same people we are dealing with majority youth uh, when ambassador Mina mohammed was still uh, at the minister of foreign affairs um she gave some solutions as to how kenyans can check against this and uh, at the top of my mind i'm now seeking for your solutions at the top of my mind is when you go to a foreign country, get registered. We have communities, you have a Kenyan community, you know, they know. And one of the allegations is that when you get there, your passport is first confiscated, you never see it unless they're bringing you back or you're coming back. So register with the community, let the consular, let uh, the embassy on the other side know you're there and for what purpose. And one of the things they don't do that is because probably you're illegal, you went as a tourist mm -hmm. and you've decided to stay, to stay there. And um, that's very important. So get registered and let the community know you're there and what you're doing mm -hmm. and who you are doing that with. So that's important. Chibukis, just your final remarks on this as before I let I you go. You, you've raised a very important point because most of the people, most of the people that, uh, that travel abroad, they go as tourists and then they don't come back. Or you go there and then you're told stories that you can marry, I don't know who, and become a citizen. You know, those kind of stories. So it becomes very hard for you to... You go to Las Vegas. And to Las, Las Vegas, Vegas <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I know friends. I know people who... actually Went right for now. rugby and never came back. Yeah! Oh, <laughs> boxing. No. Or even <laughs> musicians or comedians or artists who went for, for comedy and they never, they came, never back. came back. Okay. And, and now they, they, they don't have a state because they want, they want to become citizens of the United States, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But it's... Just be legal. Uh, let's stop being Kenyans everywhere. <laughs> you know what I'm That's very telling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, let's stop you know, being Kenyans. Yeah, go mm. go the right way. If you if you must, mm. make sure that you know your ambassador. Uh, you know, if you don't know how to reach them, ask your fellow Kenyans. We're already there. You know, if you go there and make some you know some money, hang out with your fellow Kenyans. Because also Kenyans, even outside, even in Kenya, most of us when when you have something for yourself. Then that's when Umbuakali, Unajifungia. Mm -hmm. Then now you go with the same mentality up there, and then when you start dying, is when <laughs> you start dying. You remember <laughs> the other people. <laughs> okay, Jenny. Maybe I would want to draw my concluding remarks from my field. Mm -hmm. I want to tell Kenyans let's look at addiction as a public health issue and not a moral issue. Okay, public health issue, not a moral issue. Mm -hmm. Steve. I'd like to say, maybe as I, as I, as I conclude, that. Um, the government um, must convince young people mm -hmm. that indeed it is possible to succeed in the country, that you don't need to travel abroad uh, to, to find opportunities, that opportunities can exist within us. And it can exist only if corruption is tackled and young people are empowered. Yeah. And of course, the issue of drug is also addressed. Because that's okay. again a big issue. I, I think, uh, just to add on what you're saying, in as much as we want the government also to, to convince the young people that they can make a difference here, also as young people, we need to convince ourselves that we, yes. we, we, can, we can make a difference. We can, we can. Right. And we have several examples across. Yes. Thank you, Vincent, for speaking to us. Judy, thank you, and thank you, Steve, for speaking.